all right uh, very good evening everyone so in this particular session we'll be discussing this very important topic which will be useful for your upcoming neat pg exam and as well as the fmg exam and that will be the cardiac emergencies so what all will be the cardiac emergencies in the sense which complaints related to the cardiology the patients do present to the emergency department so these are all the cardiac emergencies right these are all the cardiac emergencies with which the patient can present to the emergency department that includes the syncopal attack chest pain palpitations and as well as dyspnea so these are the four important cardiac symptoms with which the patient can present to the emergency department now let us try to discuss these important cardiac emergencies so before going ahead with so i am myself dr rajesh gubba i am the general medicine educator so for more updates related to the general medicine you can follow my instagram handle that is rajesh gubba wherein you will be having daily quizzes related to general medicine and you will be also having daily quick revision points and as well as image based questions on my instagram handle so having said that let us take up the first important cardiac emergency with which the patient can present that is the syncopal attack okay right now what are the what exactly you understand by this word the syncopal attack syncopal attack is that where the individual will have a transient loss of consciousness and this transient loss of consciousness it is self limiting right it is a self limiting transient loss of consciousness is what is called as the syncopal attack right now if you take the various etiologies of the syncopal attack we have various etiologies out of which what we are interested is in the cardiac etiologies because this particular session is mainly related to the cardiac emergencies so one is cardiac arrhythmias and the other one is the structural cardiac diseases so what may be that cardiac arrhythmias that includes either bradi arrhythmias or the tachy arrhythmias that can cause the syncopal attack and what are the structural cardiac diseases that mainly includes valvular heart diseases and what are those valvular heart diseases that can cause the syncopal attack is mainly the aortic stenosis that can cause a syncopal attack then obstructive cardiomyopathies what are those obstructive cardiomyopathies that is mainly hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy right and acute conditions like myocardial infarction why it will produce syncopal attack all that we will discuss and the other conditions like pulmonary embolism so these are the cardiac conditions which can cause the syncopal attack now what i will do is i will try to right so i will try to just summarize all the etiologies that is the cardiac etiologies which will be causing syncopal attack how will you diagnose and how will you treat those conditions so all that we will discuss now right so what are those cardiac conditions one is your complete heart block next is supraventricular tachycardia vt or vf aortic stenosis hypertrophic cardiomyopathy pulmonary embolism acute coronary syndrome and as well as the wpw syndrome and this first and second degree ab blocks they don't cause any syncopal attack but as we are discussing complete heart block parallelly i just want to discuss first and second degree ab block as well because usually they cause the giddiness or they cause the exercise intolerance which one the first and as well as second degree ab block now so if you take the clinical features in case of first and second degree ab block the clinical features will be mainly the giddiness or the exercise intolerance whereas complete heart block it will present with a syncopal attack it can also the individual can also have the giddiness now in case of the complete heart block what is the mechanism of the syncopal attack the heart rate is reduced so cardiac output will be reduced so cerebral perfusion will be reduced so the mechanism is 
the heart rate is being reduced. Whereas you take in other conditions like SVT, VT or VF. In case of SVT, VT or VF, what could be the cause for the syncopal attack? In these individuals, the heart rate is increased, but the stroke volume is reduced. So because the stroke volume is reduced, the cardiac output will be reduced. So cerebral perfusion will be reduced. That can cause the syncopal attack. Whereas aortic stenosis and as well as the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, both of them, they are obstructive pathologies. Where exactly will be the obstruction at the left ventricular outflow tract? Because of obstruction, the cardiac output will be reduced. Cerebral perfusion will be reduced. Thereby, there can be syncopal attack. Next, coming to your pulmonary embolism. In patients with pulmonary embolism, there will be increase in the pulmonary artery pressure. There will be pulmonary hypertension. Because of pulmonary hypertension, there will be increased afterload on the right ventricle. So, the interventricular septum will be pushed into the LV lumen. So, LV volume reduces. As the LV volume reduces, the cardiac output reduces and thereby there will be decreased cerebral perfusion resulting in syncopal attack. Then you take in case of the acute coronary syndrome. In case of acute coronary syndrome, what happens is the left ventricle will get infarcted. Once the left ventricle gets infarcted, what will happen? The stroke volume reduces as the stroke volume reduces, the cardiac output also reduces. And WPW syndrome is what? It's a pre-excitation syndrome. So pre-excitation syndrome, here also the cardiac output will be reduced. What is the mechanism and all we will be discussing. So whatever I am discussing now, they are all the etiologies which will cardiac causes for your syncopal attack. Now, let me take up the discussion one by one. So first degree AV block, second degree AV block, and as well as third degree AV block. So you take first degree AV block, there is just prolonged PR interval, right? Then second degree AV block, again, we have two types, Mobitz type one and as well as Mobitz type two. In case of Mobitz type one, there will be progressive prolongation of PR interval, and there will be intermittent drop in the QR, QRS complex. Okay, that is what is your Mobitz type one, which is also called Winky Bax phenomenon. Whereas in case of Mobitz type two, what will happen is there will be a constant PR interval, but there is drop in the QRS complex intermittently. That will be Mobitz type two. Whereas Third degree heart block, this is complete heart block. These patients, they present with the syncopal attacks. And in these individuals with complete heart block, the atrial rate will be much more than compared to that of the ventricular rate. Okay, atrial rate will be much more compared to that of the ventricular rate. So, that is about the discussion of the AV blocks, which can cause the syncopal attacks. So on examination, what do these patients have? These patients, they have bradycardia. So how do you diagnose? Right. So how do you diagnose these conditions? The diagnosis of these conditions is by the ECG, right? Diagnosis of these conditions is ECG. And just now we have discussed like what will be the ECG findings, right? Then how do you treat these patients is very, very important. So these three conditions, first degree AV block, Mobitz type one, Mobitz type two, first degree AV block, there is no treatment required, right? Only you need to treat whatever is the underlying cause. Whereas Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2, the drug that you can give is atropine and you have to treat the underlying cause. And Mobitz type 2 patients, they may require permanent pacemaker, right? They may require permanent pacemaker. Whereas in complete heart block, 
what will be the first line intervention first line intervention that you need to do is the temporary pacemaker insertion whereas what will be the treatment of choice if it is a reversible cause for complete heart block like electrolyte abnormalities like hyperkalemia so if it is reversible cause then you treat the underlying reversible cause for complete heart block if it is an irreversible cause for complete heart block then they require permanent pacemaker okay so that is about the treatment of the complete heart block so whatever we have discussed now about the syncopal attack is first degree av block second degree av block and complete heart block we have discussed now coming to the svt supraventricular tachycardia this is also one of the very important etiology which can cause the syncopal attack and on examination what is that you will find you will find tachycardia and what type of tachycardia a regular tachycardia will be there right it is a regular rhythm tachycardia and how will you diagnose this svt that is mainly by your ecg and what will be the ecg findings in patients with the svt so the ecg findings in patients with the svt will be this will be a narrow complex tachycardia right and the rhythm will be regular rhythm and in these individuals with svt there is no p wave so you can just observe very carefully here there is no p wave you are having a qrs complex and then you are having a t wave but you don't have the p wave then where does this p wave go then this particular p wave it gets merged in a qrs complex or it will appear after the qrs complex so it will be like qrs p and then t that is what you will have in case of the svt so how will you diagnose your supraventricular tachycardia that is by your ecg then how do you treat see the first line treatment for your svt will be stimulation of the vagal maneuvers right the stimulation of the vagal maneuvers that will be the first line treatment and if the vagal maneuvers fail what will be the drug of choice the drug of choice will be adenosine okay drug of choice will be adenosine okay so this will be the algorithm that we need to follow for the svt so it is a regular narrow complex tachycardia for suppose if the individual is hemodynamically unstable then you need to do cardioversion and you need to know how many joules we require for doing the cardioversion that is nearly around 50 to 100 joules and if the patient does not respond you can increase up to 200 joules also if the patient is hemodynamically unstable for suppose if the the patient is hemodynamically stable then the first line treatment will be stimulation of the vagal maneuvers then drug of choice will be adenosine that is you need to give 6 mg of adenosine if the patient does not respond you need to give 12 mg of adenosine and with adenosine if the patient is not responding then what is the next important treatment either non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers that is delta azam or verapamil or the beta blockers should be given with this calcium channel blockers or beta blockers if the patient is not responding then you need to give anti arrhythmic drugs like amiodarone should be given but in spite of giving anti arrhythmic drugs if there is recurrent svt then finally what is the treatment of choice the treatment of choice will be the catheter ablation now at this vagal maneuvers the first line treatment what did we discuss it is the vagal maneuvers now vagal maneuvers there are various methodologies of eliciting the vagal maneuvers number one basically what you need to do you need to increase the intrathoracic pressure so once you increase the intrathoracic pressure there will be increase in 
the parasympathetic activity. Right? There will be increase in the parasympathetic activity. So how can you do that? Number one, by doing Valsalva maneuver. That is one method. And the second method of stimulating the vagus is you need to breathe hard into a syringe against the pressure to increase the intrathoracic pressure. Or you need to raise the legs abruptly to increase the venous return. The other method is diverse reflex, where the individual has to submerge the face into the cold water. That is called diverse reflex. The other one is the familiarly known, that is the carotid sinus massage. So these are the various, the vagal maneuvers. And all these vagal maneuvers, what they will do? They will increase the parasympathetic stimulus to the cardiac pacemaker. And that will cause the bradycardia. And if the vagal maneuvers fail, then we give this adenosine if the individual is hemodynamically stable. If the individual is hemodynamically unstable, then we need to do cardioversion. So that is about your SVT. So we have discussed AV blocks and as well as SVT, which can cause the syncopal attacks. Then the other important cardiac emergency that is syncopal attack, which can be caused is by your ventricular tachycardia or the ventricular fibrillation. So this ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, they are of various morphologies. So how will you identify that? So these are all the various ECG strips of your VT. So if you take the first strip, this will be monomorphic VT. Right? This will be monomorphic VT. Now, what you have to know is, in these patients with VT, I have explained you the mechanism of the syncopal attack. That is, there will be decrease in the stroke volume and subsequently causing decrease in the cardiac output. And in these individuals, Along with syncopal attack, there will be also palpitations, right? Along with syncopal attack, they will also have palpitations. That is another important associated symptom. And how will you diagnose this VT or VF? That is mainly by your ECG. So in the ECG, how will you diagnose this VT and VF? Let me try to discuss that. So like first important rhythm what I have given you is monomorphic VT. What do you understand by the word monomorphic VT? It is the uh, ECG strip or rhythm where you have wide complexes. Right? It's a wide complex tachycardia. And all the complexes will be of same morphology. Right? That is what is called as monomorphic VT. Now, what is this strip B? It is suggestive of the ventricular flutter. Ventricular flutter, it is the one it will appear between your VT and as well as the VF, ventricular fibrillation. It remains very short. It remains very short and it appears between VT and as well as the ventricular fibrillation. And that is what is your ventricular flutter. And what is the description of the ventricular flutter? How will you recognize that? It is a continuous sine wave. Right? If you observe the morphologies, it's a continuous sine wave. There is no identifiable P wave. There is no identifiable QRS complex. There is no identifiable T wave. And how much will be the rate? Ventricular rate will be more than 200 beats per minute. That is what is your ventricular flutter. And the third one, that is C, it is also VT of electrolyte abnormalities because the complexes are very broad and the rate is around 150. And your D is polymorphic VT. Right, this will be polymorphic VT. So how will you tell it is a polymorphic VT? Because if you take the complexes, they are of variable morphologies. That is why it is called polymorphic VT. And this particular ECG strip is of ventricular fibrillation. So how will you tell it is ventricular fibrillation? You don't have identifiable 
QRS complexes. That will be your VF, ventricular fibrillation. Then how do you treat this your VT or VF? It all depends upon whether the individual is hemodynamically stable or unstable. So if you see the algorithm in the treatment of your VT or VF, if the individual is hemodynamically unstable, then you need to give DC shock of 200 joules to 360 joules. Right, 200 to 360 joules you need to give. And after giving this DC shock, if there is recurrence, then you need to give anti-arrhythmic drugs that is amidrone or lignocaine can be given. And what are the drugs which are given for maintenance therapy? This amidrone is the drug which is given for maintenance. Right, amidrone is the drug which is given for maintenance of the sinus rhythm. And the beta blockers are the one which are given mainly to reduce the heart rate. And you need to identify what is the cause for VT or VF. And accordingly, you need to treat the underlying cause as well. For example, if the VT is secondary to your acute ischemia, then you need to give ACS therapy. That is acute coronary syndrome therapy should be given. Along with that, you need to give amidrone or the lidocaine should, can be given. Okay. Next. And if the VT is secondary to long QT syndrome, that we call it as torsades D pointers. In this case, the drug of choice will be magnesium sulfate. And the other drugs that we give is beta blocker. And in spite of giving these drugs, if the individual is refractory, then IV lidocaine should be given if the VT is secondary to prolonged QT syndrome. So that is about your syncopal attack secondary to VT or VF. Okay, right. Then what are we discussing now? Cardiac emergencies. What are all the various uh, presentations of cardiac emergencies? Syncopal attack, palpitations, chest pain, and dyspnea. And what we are discussing now, we are discussing the first one, that is the syncopal attack. Okay, right. So if you take the syncopal attack, we have discussed these four causes for syncopal attack, where the individual can present to the emergency department. Now, coming to the aortic stenosis. Even these patients with aortic stenosis, they can present with the syncopal attack. And in aortic stenosis, the clinical features you need to remember is the SAD. What is SAD? SAD stands for syncopal attack, angina, and dyspnea. So this will be SAD in case of the aortic stenosis. And on examination, you have very, very important findings in case of aortic stenosis. You have a characteristic pulse that is pulses, parvus, etitardus in case of aortic stenosis. And what will happen to the systolic blood pressure? that will be reduced. And how will be the pulse pressure? They will have a narrow pulse pressure because the systolic blood pressure is reduced. In cardiac examination, your A2 will be soft, right? And there will be a narrow split S2 or there can be reversible split in the sense there can be P2 followed by that A2. You will have this in case of very severe aortic stenosis. Then apical impulse, heaving type of apical impulse, murmur. It is ejection systolic murmur, which is a very harsh ejection systolic murmur, which is heard best in the second right intercostal space, parasternal area. And at this point, you also need to know about the Galaverdin phenomenon. So Galaverdin phenomenon is that the murmur of the aortic stenosis will radiate to the apex. That is what is called the Galaverdin phenomenon. So this will be the examination findings in patients with the aortic stenosis. And how will you diagnose this aortic stenosis? Uh, yes, Nishant, I will share this PDF. I'll be sharing this PDF on my Instagram handle. You can collect it from there. Okay, that is Rajesh Gubba. Okay. So how will you diagnose is by 2D code. 
So today will be the first line uh, investigation for diagnosing aortic stenosis, where the valve area will be less than two centimeters square to call it as aortic stenosis. And treatment. If the individual is asymptomatic, right? If the individual is asymptomatic, then the drugs that we can give is beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, then statins. Why do we give this particular statins? That will prevent the progression of the aortic stenosis. For suppose, if the individual is symptomatic, so symptomatic aortic stenosis, right? Or if the ejection fraction in aortic stenosis, if it is less than 50%, then you need to do surgical treatment. That is surgical aortic valve replacement or transcatheter aortic valve replacement has to be done. So this is what is nothing but your tower, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It can be done through the femoral route or it can be also done through the carotid approach. Okay. So symptomatic aortic stenosis, definitely you need to do surgical treatment. Okay. Either surgical aortic valve replacement by cutting open the chest and removing the valve and replace the new valve, that is prosthetic valve, or through the femoral route, minimal invasive, that is transcatheter aortic valve replacement can be done. So that is about your the aortic stenosis, which can cause the syncopal attack. And another important obstructive lesion which can cause the syncopal attack is the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And that too, which form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Mainly it is not apical hypertrophy. It is mainly the septal hypertrophy that can cause the syncopal attack. Most of the time, these patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they remain asymptomatic. They directly present with sudden cardiac death. If at all, if they are symptomatic, they can present with dyspnea. They can present with giddiness. They can present with chest pain. And they can also present with syncopal attack. That is because of decreased cerebral perfusion. And on examination, what is a very important finding in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? The very important finding is a characteristic pulse. And this characteristic pulse will be pulses bispherians. And cardiac examination, what is very important is they will have double apical impulse. And they will also have double carotid upstroke. And how will you diagnose? You can diagnose it by your 2D code. Or even the ECG also will help in diagnosis of your hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So in ECG, what will you have? You will have the features of left ventricular hypertrophy. Or you will have the features of the left ventricular strain pattern. You will have the features of left ventricular strain pattern, which is nothing but asymmetrical T wave inversion, which is nothing but asymmetrical T wave inversion. That is what is nothing but strain pattern. Okay. So, and next, the first line investigation will be the 2D echo. And in the 2D echo, what all the things you will observe is you can observe the septal thickness. The septal thickness should be more than. 1.5 centimeters, right? The septal thickness should be more than 1.5 centimeters to call it as the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And another important thing is they will have systolic anterior motion of, right? Systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve leaflet towards the hypertrophic septum. And they will have diastolic dysfunction, right? Diastolic dysfunction. So this will cause heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So that will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Then how will you treat these patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? See, the treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, first and foremost, you should advise avoidance of the exertional activity. And what will be the drug of choice? Drug of choice will be beta blocker. And if the there is any contraindication to the beta blocker, we give non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And with the medical management, if the individual is refractory, then alcohol septal ablation can be done. Right? And the other important methodology of treatment is septal myomectomy can be done. So that is about your hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Right? Next. So after having discussed about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy causing the syncopal attack, 
The next important condition which can cause the syncopal attack is the pulmonary embolism. Actually, pulmonary embolism, what may be the clinical feature? The important clinical feature will be sudden onset dyspnea. That will be the important clinical manifestation in patients with the pulmonary embolism. And if it is a small embolism, the individual can also develop chest pain due to pulmonary infarction. But why there will be syncopal attack? Already I have discussed. In pulmonary embolism, there will be increased afterload on the right ventricle. So because of which the right ventricular pressure increases, that will push the interventricular septum to the left ventricle. So LV lumen reduces. When LV lumen reduces, LV volume reduces. When LV volume reduces, the cardiac output reduces and decreases cerebral perfusion, resulting in syncopal attack. And on examination, these patients, they will have tachycardia. And cardiac examination, what is very important is the P2 will be loud. Right? The P2 will be loud in patients with the pulmonary embolism. Then, how will you diagnose your uh, pulmonary embolism? The investigation of choice is contrast enhanced CT scan. Right? And if contrast enhanced CT scan is unequivocal, right? If, if it is not giving proper information, the best investigation will be CT pulmonary angiography, which is an invasive method. And in pregnancy and all, we, can, we cannot use this particular CT scan where we use the VP scan. Ventilation perfusion scan can be done. And apart from these investigations, what are the other very important investigations in pulmonary embolism? In pulmonary embolism, the ECG is very important. What will be the most common ECG finding? Most common ECG finding in pulmonary embolism will be sinus tachycardia. And what are the other ECG findings? There will be right, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, and right ventricular strain, which is nothing but P wave inversion in the right sided leads. And this S1 Q, Q3 T3 pattern, this S1 Q3 T3 pattern, it is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patients. And the next important is the x rays are very important in pulmonary embolism. The presence of a wedge shaped infarct is nothing but Hampton's hump, which can be seen in pulmonary embolism. Presence of enlarged right descending pulmonary artery in pulmonary embolism is called as the Pallas sign. And next important is the focal oligemia in the chest x-ray in case of pulmonary embolism is called as the Western mark sign. And 2D echo is also very important in case of pulmonary embolism. That is the McConnell sign. What is McConnell sign? McConnell sign is that where the right ventricular free wall, hypokinesia will be there. Okay, right ventricular free wall, hypokinesia will be there. Whereas apex, there will be increased motility of the apex. That is what is called as the McConnell sign. And how do you treat these patients with the pulmonary embolism? The treatment completely depends upon the blood pressure of the individual and as well as right ventricular function. If the blood pressure is normal and there is normal right ventricular function, anticoagulation alone. And if there is normal blood pressure and RV hypokinesia is there, you need to individualize the therapy. That is, if the individual is a young individual, then you need to do thrombolysis with tissue plasminogen activator or altiplase or retiplase. But if there is a hypotension, definitely you need to do thrombolysis. And if the individual is at increased risk of your bleeding tendency, then you need to do embolectomy. So that is about your pulmonary embolism. Okay. So what all we have discussed now? We have discussed these many etiologies which will be causing syncopal attack, which are the cardiac causes wherein they can present to the emergency department. And the other important causes are the acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome, usually these patients, they present with the chest pain. But why do you think that these patients can present with syncopal attack? When the myocardial infarction is massive, if there is massive anterior wall MI, in such case, LV contractility reduces, cardiac output reduces, and cerebral perfusion reduces where they can present with the syncopal attack. And this acute coronary syndrome, I'll discuss this separately in the presentation of chest pain. 
then come to the wpw syndrome that is a pre excitation syndrome which is also nothing but wolf parkinson's white syndrome now these patients with the wpw syndrome they also can present with the syncopal attack actually along with the syncopal attack they also have palpitations so why is that these patients they have palpitations that is because they will develop either atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation that is the reason why they can have palpitations and because of decrease in stroke volume there can be decrease in cardiac output decrease in cerebral perfusion and thereby there will be right thereby there will be a uh, syncopal attack and how will you diagnose this wpw syndrome diagnosis is mainly by your ecg and basically what is this wpw syndrome it's a pre excitation syndrome where you have a presence of an accessory pathway and through this accessory pathway ventricle will receive impulse directly from the sa node bypassing the av node so the ventricle is contracting directly and it is not through the conducting system and such particular ventricular contractions are weak stroke volume will be reduced cardiac output will be reduced and there can be syncopal attack so what will be the ecg changes everyone is aware of there will be a short pr interval there will be delta wave and there will be also wide qrs complex and all these are mainly because of the accessory pathway and very important thing you need to know is which side accessory pathways are more common is it right side accessory pathways more common or left side accessory pathways more common please remember left side accessory pathways right they are more common which is nothing but your bundle of kent right so that kent bundle is more common on the left side than compared to right side then how will you diagnose by seeing the ecg whether the accessory pathway is it on the right side or is it on the left side just remember one important thing if the ecg is showing rbbb pattern or if the ecg is showing tall r wave in v1 with short pr interval delta wave and wide qrs complex just remember that in this scenario the accessory pathway is on the left side right the accessory pathway is on the left side okay next and you take the other ecg short pr interval delta wave wide qrs complex but if the individual is having the ecg of lbbb pattern in this case along with lbbb pattern if there is short pr interval delta wave and wide qrs complex here the pathway will be right sided accessory pathway so this is how you will identify right so this is what is your lbbb pattern so this is how you will identify whether the pathway is on the right side or the left side and so the methodology by which you will diagnose your wpw syndrome is mainly by ecg then how do you treat so drug of choice in case of wpw syndrome will be flecainide right or the beta blocker that you can give is i'm sorry right so flecainide will be the drug of choice if the individual develops atrial fibrillation then treatment of choice will be radio frequency ablation treatment of choice will be radio frequency ablation so this particular table gives you the etiologies causing syncopal attack and thereby the individual presenting to the emergency department so that is one of the cardiac emergency so we have finished the syncopal attack the other symptomatology with which the patient can present to the emergency department is the chest pain now what are all the various cardiac causes for chest pain the cardiac causes for chest pain it includes angina acute coronary syndrome pericarditis aortic stenosis and mitral valve prolapse syndrome coming to the angina right so it will be a typical chest pain what will be the typical chest pain the chest pain will be retrosternal in location it increases on exertion and decreases by taking rest that will be a typical stable angina presentation and diagnosis is mainly by your ecg but ecg will not confirm this particular angina 
because in ECG, what is that you can find out some non-specific STT changes, right? Non-specific STT changes. So in this ECG, you can see T wave inversions in lateral wall. But just by seeing this T wave inversion, can you confirm the stable angina? No, because T wave inversions are present in many conditions. It can be there in bundle branch blocks. It can be there in left ventricular strain pattern or even right ventricular strain pattern. And these T wave inversions can also be there even in electrolyte abnormalities like uh, hypokalemia. So along with symptomatology, if the ECG is showing non-specific STD changes, then what you should advise the patient is the treadmill test, TMT. Now, when will you consider the TMT to be positive? So whenever you start the exercise, there should be development of ST segment depression. And it should not be upsloping ST de uh, segment depression. It should be downsloping ST segment depression. To consider TMT positive, it should be downsloping ST segment depression and it should be more than or equal to 1 mm from the J point. 60 to 80 milliseconds after the J point, it should be downsloping ST segment depression of more than or equal to 1 mm. This is what is considered to be TMT positive. Once the TMT is positive, we confirm that the patient is having the stable angina where we will do a coronary angiogram. If the coronary angiogram shows the blockade more than 70%, then we do a, we place a stent. And if the blockade is less than 70%, then we discharge the patient on antiplatelets and as well as the statins, okay? So this will be the treatment for your stable angina. So ECG, TMT, treatment will be antiplatelets and then statins. Then coming to the next important uh, cardiac emergency uh, that can present with chest pain is the ACS, that is acute coronary syndrome. So in acute coronary syndrome, what all will be the... Um, Conditions which comes under your acute coronary syndrome. Unstable angina, non-ST segment elevation MI, and as well as ST segment elevation MI, right? And what will be the character of the pain? It is not the pain which will increase on exertion, or it is like, you see, the chest pain in case of acute coronary syndrome, it is present at rest. And as the time progresses, the pain increases, okay? And how will you diagnose by your acute coronary syndrome is by your ECG and as well as the cardiac biomarkers. So again, ECG, if you take, in case of unstable angina and non-ST segment elevation MI, you will have non-specific STT changes, right? Whereas in NSTEMI, there can be ST segment depression. Cardiac biomarkers, that is your troponin T and your, cardiac, uh, your CKMB, they are elevated only in case of NSTEMI and as well as the STEMI, that is ST elevation MI, okay? Right. And... And how will you treat these patients? See, for unstable angina and as well as non-ST segment elevation MI, the treatment will be more or less same, right? What is that? What will be the first line treatment in case of acute coronary syndrome? The first line treatment in case of acute coronary syndrome will be aspirin. Along with aspirin, we give clopidogrel and as well as the statins. And thrombolysis should not be done in case of unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI, what we give is anticoagulant, either low molecular weight heparin or you can give fondaparinox in case of unstable angina and non-ST segment elevation MI. Once the chest pain is reduced and for the chest pain, what we give, we give either nitrates or we give morphine, right? That we give for chest pain. And then you need to do coronary angiogram. If the coronary angiogram shows blockage more than 70%, then you need to place a stent. Then coming to STEMI, ST elevation MI. In case of ST elevation MI, what is it? It's a transmural infarction. 100% blockade is there within the vessel. Then only you get this particular STEMI. And what is the criteria to call it as STEMI? In the contiguous leads, 
there should be more than 2 mm st segment elevation if it is the precordial leads and if it is uh, the limb leads or augmented leads the st segment elevation should be more than 1 mm if it is the augmented leads or limb leads but it should be in the more than or equal to 2 contiguous leads and once you diagnose it is an st elevation mi then in case of st elevation mi we we have various methodologies of revascularization percutaneous coronary intervention then thrombolysis then coronary artery bypass graft but among all these what is the best method for revascularization that is percutaneous coronary intervention that is the best method and if the patient presents as early as possible the early you do revascularization more myocardium will be saved and more will be the out, good will be the output whereas thrombolysis we have many thrombolytic agents streptokinase altiplase retiplase tenecteplase and urokinase but among all these the revascularization is maximum with tenecteplase right with tenecteplase the revascularization is maximum compared to all these thrombolytic agents and thrombolysis should not be done if the patient presents beyond 12 hours because by that time it is completely infarcted so that is about your acute coronary syndrome where the individual can present with the chest pain and the next is the pericarditis pericarditis like what will be the character of the pain it is like a pointed pain where the individual can localize the pain and in these patients with the pericarditis there is a triad on examination there will be pericardial rub and ecg there will be concave st segment elevation in all the leads except avr in avr there will be st segment depression then pr segment depression will be there in all the leads except avr where there will be pr segment elevation and how do you treat these patients with the pericarditis the treatment is by nsaids that is aspirin and if with aspirin if the patient does, if the chest pain does not subside in case of pericarditis you need to give steroids and if you take the pericarditis like what is the most important etiology that will cause acute pericarditis it is mainly the viral etiologies right and what will be that viral etiologies the most commonly it is coxsackie virus and followed by that the eco virus so that will be your pericarditis so this will be the ecg of pericarditis where you have st segment elevation in all the leads and that too concave st segment elevation except avr where you have st segment depression and if you observe pr segment the pr segment is depressed in all the leads except avr where there will be pr segment elevation so that is about your pericarditis next coming to the aortic stenosis where the individual can present to the emergency department with chest pain as already i have said you in aortic stenosis you have a triad syncopal attack angina and dyspnea and why is this particular angina that is because demand is more in aortic stenosis there will be left ventricular hypertrophy so the demand will be more but cardiac output will is reduced because of obstruction so demand is more and supply is less and that is the reason why the individual can present with chest pain so not only aortic stenosis even the other obstructive lesion that is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy they also can present with chest pain and regarding aortic stenosis already i have discussed in detail when i was discussing about the syncopal attack one of the emergency then coming to your mvps that is mitral valve prolapse syndrome mitral valve prolapse syndrome mostly they are asymptomatic mostly they are asymptomatic if at all if they present with the symptom what will be the most common symptom it will be palpitations most common symptom in mvps will be palpitations and if they present with chest pain it will be atypical chest pain and what exactly is the cause for chest pain is also not known and in these patients with the mvps what is the criteria to call it as mitral valve prolapse syndrome see the mitral valves they have to prolapse more than 2 mm from the mitral valve annulus that is what is the criteria for mitral valve prolapse and what will be the etiology for your mitral valve prolapse most common cause is idiopathic we don't know what exactly is the cause and it may be associated with other connective tissue disorders like marfan's ehlers danlos syndrome 
And examination is very, very important in case of mitral valve prolapse. What will be that? That is mainly the cardiac examination. And that cardiac examination will be in the form of mid-systolic click. Right? Mid-systolic click with late systolic murmur. That will be the important examination finding in patients with the MBPS. Mid-systolic click with late systolic murmur. And this late systolic murmur, it's a high-pitched murmur. And it's a crescendo decrescendo murmur. And it is best heard at the apex. Right? It is best heard at the apex. And this particular murmur, either it will radiate to the axilla or it will radiate to the base of the heart. Dynamic auscultation is very, very important in mitral valve prolapse syndrome. What is this dynamic auscultation? Just remember, any maneuver which will increase the venous return, what will happen to the click? The click will be delayed, the murmur will be shortened. And any maneuver which will decrease the venous return, the click will be early, murmur will be prolonged. That will be uh, dynamic auscultation in mitral valve prolapse syndrome. And what will be the drug of choice in these patients with the mitral valve prolapse syndrome? So diagnosis, you will do it by 2D echo, right? And the treatment, drug of choice will be beta blockers, okay? So that will be your MBPS, mitral valve prolapse syndrome, which can present with the cardiac emergence. That is chest pain, chest pain presenting in case of mitral valve prolapse syndrome. So what are the cardiac emergencies we have discussed now? We have discussed syncopal attack, one of the cardiac emergency, chest pain, another important cardiac emergency. And third important cardiac emergency uh, where the patient can present to the emergency department is the palpitations. Palpitations are most commonly seen in case of the arrhythmias, right? Most commonly seen in case of arrhythmias, or it can also be seen in case of valvular lesions. Okay. So apart from arrhythmias, the other conditions which can cause palpitations is valvular lesions like MR and AR. They present with the palpitations. Okay. Now, coming to the arrhythmias, what all arrhythmias are there which can present with the palpitations? First and foremost, it is your sinus tachycardia. Right. So, how will you identify this particular sinus tachycardia is mainly by your ECG. And what will be the ECG changes? In case of sinus tachycardia, please remember, you will have a normal sinus P wave, normal QRS complex, and normal T wave. Only thing, the heart rate will be increased more than 100. And how will you treat? See, all these arrhythmias, how will you reduce the heart rate? By giving the beta blockers. Or non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers should be given for reducing the heart rate. It all depends upon the individual clinical scenario. Even sinus tachycardia, you need to treat the underlying cause and you need to give beta blockers if you are not able to make out what is the underlying cause. Then, next important is the atrial tachycardia and premature atrial contractures. They also can present with the uh, palpitations. Now, first, we will uh, let me show you the ECG of the atrial tachycardia. See, so this is the ECG of the atrial tachycardia. See, the in atrial tachycardia, the P wave morphology will be different. You will have one is to one conduction, right? You will have one is to one conduction, but P wave morphology will be different. Okay, from you take this P wave to this P wave, this P wave to this P wave. So they are like completely different uh, P waves. That is how you will diagnose atrial tachycardia. And how will you treat atrial tachycardia? This will not convert to sinus rhythm with vagal maneuvers or adenosine. No adenosine, no vagal maneuvers. You need to give beta blockers. Or you need to give diltiazem or verapamil. Okay? That will be your atrial tachycardia. And so we have done with sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, and premature atrial contractures. See, this premature atrial contractures is another clinical condition where the individual can present with the palpitations. In case of premature atrial contracture, the premature complex, right? So you will have an abnormal P wave compared to the other P waves. And exactly before that abnormal P wave, the RR interval will be shortened. And exactly after that complex, 
the RR interval will be prolonged compared to the other RR intervals. That is how you will identify the premature atrial contractures. And what are the causes for premature atrial contractures? Excessive coffee, decreased sleep, exercise, they all can cause premature atrial contractures and they can present with palpitations and it's a benign rhythm. You advise the patient not to worry at all. And worrying thing is MAT, multifocal atrial tachycardia. So in case of MAT, how will you diagnose this particular MAT? The diagnosis of this MAT, that is multifocal atrial tachycardia is, you have more than or equal to three different P waves. And heart rate will be more than 100 per minute. And what is the common condition where you will see this MAT? That is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the treatment is beta blockers. If it is in COPD, if you cannot give beta blockers, what is that you will give? You have to give the calcium channel blockers. That is diltiazem or verapamil should be given. That is about your MAT, where the patient can present with the palpitations. Next thing is the atrial fibrillation. So how will you identify the ECG of atrial fibrillation? First and foremost, the rhythm. The rhythm will be irregularly irregular rhythm. So how can you make out it's an irregularly irregular rhythm? You have variable RR interval and you don't have the P wave. So instead of P wave, what you have is the fibrillatory waves. That is how you will identify the ECG of atrial fibrillation. And how will you treat this atrial fibrillation? Three things, rate control, rhythm control, and anticoagulation or antiplatelets. You should decide. Rate control, we give beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Rhythm control, we give amiodarone, right? Or the other drugs that you can give is ibutylide, right? Anticoagulants, whether to give or not, it all depends upon your char 2 ds 2 vas scoring system. And these are the parameters of your char 2 ds 2 vas scoring system. And if the score is zero, right? No aspirin or no anticoagulant. No therapy is preferred. And if score is one, either you give antiplatelet, no anticoagulant. If the score is more than or equal to two, then you need to give oral anticoagulant. But whenever you are giving this oral anticoagulant, when the score is more than or equal to two, you need to calculate the Hesblet score. This Hesblet score will tell you whether the individual is at risk of bleeding or not with anticoagulants. And if the score is like more than or equal to three, then you need to closely monitor whenever you are giving the oral anticoagulants. And these are all the parameters in your Hesblet score. So that is about your the atrial fibrillation. Then coming to the atrial flutter. So in case of atrial flutter, what will be the characteristic ECG? You have a sawtoothed pattern of P waves. And what will be the treatment? That will be beta blockers. Or you can also give the calcium channel blockers. But what is the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? In case of atrial fibrillation, you don't have identifiable P waves. What you have there is the fibrillatory waves. Whereas in atrial flutter, the P waves will be of sawtoothed pattern. And treatment is beta blockers or calcium channel blockers should be given. So that is about your uh, the atrial etiologies or atrial pathologies which can present with palpitations coming to your ventricular pathologies. That is your premature ventricular contracture. So how will you identify pre PVC premature ventricular contracture? You have an abnormally wide QRS complex. And to this QRS complex, there is no P wave at all. That will be your premature ventricular contracture. And T wave will be exactly inverted or T wave will be exactly opposite to that of the QRS axis. If the QRS is positive, the T wave will be negative. If the QRS is negative, the T wave will be positive. Okay. So this is about your premature ventricular contracture, which can present with the palpitations. And what will be the treatment? The treatment will be the beta blockers. Okay. That is about your PVCs. So what we have done now, we have done up to premature ventricular contracture. This VT and VF already we have discussed. 
But let me tell you all the conditions which can cause VT and VF where the individual can have a sudden cardiac death. See, all these conditions, right? All these conditions, they die because of your VT or VF. Let me try to discuss some of the important conditions. Structurally normal heart, sudden cardiac death. You can see that in case of Brugada syndrome, long QT syndrome, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, some commotio cordis, where there will be blunt injury over the chest during the exertion, canalopathies, electrolyte abnormalities, and WPW syndrome. Let me discuss some of the very, very important conditions. And structurally abnormal heart causing sudden cardiac death will be these conditions, out of which I will discuss this arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. The remaining already I have discussed like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and all. Coming to the first important thing that is Brugada syndrome. See, Brugada syndrome, it is a sodium channelopathy, right? Where there is abnormality in SCN 5A. And these patients, they suddenly die during the sleep. And that is the reason why it is also called sudden unexpected nocturnal death syndrome. And how will you diagnose this Brugada syndrome? That is mainly by your ST segment elevation. And that too ST segment elevation will be code ST segment elevation from V1 to V3. Right? V1 to V3, there will be code ST segment elevation. Right? And these patients, they will have the family history of sudden cardiac death. And the drug of choice will be Sotalol. Right? And treatment of choice will be implantable cardioverter defibrillator. That is about your Brugada syndrome where the individual will have structurally normal heart and sudden cardiac death can be there. Diag the diagnosis is mainly by your ECG. The other important condition, structurally normal heart where you can have sudden cardiac death due to your VT or VF is your long QT syndrome. See, when will you call long QT syndrome? Corrected QT interval in case of females, if it is more than 480 milliseconds, and in males, if the corrected QT interval is more than 470 milliseconds, then we call it as the long QT syndrome. And these patients with the long QT syndrome, the diagnosis is by your ECG only. But how will you treat? Treatment is by beta blocker. The effective beta blocker will be your Sotalol. Or the other drug we can give is class 1 antiarrhythmic drug, that is mixilitin. Right, And what will be the treatment of choice? Treatment of choice will be, I see, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. This, right, this uh, uh, ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator, that will prevent the development of your VT and VF, and that will make the individual to survive. So that is about your long QT syndrome. So we are done with the Brugada. We are done with the long QT syndrome. Now let me discuss this catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. See, this catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, it's a condition characterized by abnormal heart rhythm, that is your VT or VF. But when will this VT or VF will develop? The individual will have normal sinus rhythm, but as the physical activity increases or the emotional stress of the individual increases, that will trigger an abnormally fast heartbeat. And that will make the individual to develop a VT. And that particular VT will be of polymorphic. That means all the QRS complexes will not be of same morphology. And that is the reason why it is called as polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And that too, catecholaminergic. You see this particular ECG strip, the same individual. How will you diagnose this polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? By exercise tolerance test. So this is the resting ECG. This is after 3 minutes, 21 seconds of the exercise, where you can see one premature ventricular contracture. And then at 3 minutes, 36 seconds, you can see many premature ventricular contractures appearing. Then at 4 minutes, 21 seconds, at 4 minutes, 46 seconds, you can observe a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And once the individual, you make them to make him to rest, you will get back the normal ECG again. And 
what is the important uh, uh, etiology uh, that is responsible for your catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia? That is mainly due to gene mutation. And that particular gene which is being mutated is RYR2 gene. And this RYR2 gene, it encodes a protein which is included in ion channel that is called rhinodine receptor. Okay. So basically, the gene which is being mutated is RYR2 gene. So you can diagnose this by exercise tolerance test, and you can confirm this by genetic testing. And how do you treat this? You need to give beta blocker, or the other dr uh, drug that you can give is flecainide, which is a class 1 antiarrhythmic drug. And what will be the surgical treatment that you can do in this individual? The surgical treatment is, it is catecholaminergic. So, you can do sympathetic denervation, right? Sympathetic denervation or ICD can be placed, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So, that is about your CPVT, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. And another important condition where you have structurally abnormal heart, where the individual can develop VT or VF and can have sudden cardiac death is your ARVD, that is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. See, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia is that the right ventricular myocardium is replaced by the fibro fatty tissue. And what is the etiology? That is mainly due to mutation of the genes. What is the gene which is being mutated? That will be desmoplakin, then placoglobin, then Desmocolin 2 and SRC interacting protein. So that will be genes which are being mutated because of which right ventricular myocardium is replaced by the fibro fatty tissue. And most of this uh, ARVD is associated with one of the inherited condition, which is an autosomal recessive type of inheritance that is called Naxos disease, where the individual will have the woolly hair and as well as abnormality within the skin. That is nothing but palmo plantar, right? Palmo plantar keratoderma. That is, these are the two important features of your Naxos disease. That is woolly hair and palmo plantar keratoderma. Okay. And this Naxos disease is the one which is associated with ARVD. And how will you diagnose this ARVD? Diagnosis of this ARVD is mainly by appearance of the epsilon wave in V1 to V3. And what is that epsilon wave? You have a blip at the J point. That is after the QRS complex from V1 to V2. So that is how you will diagnose this ARVD, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, right? And how will you treat these patients? Okay, diagnosis is by your epsilon wave, but it is not 100% sensitive and specific. How will you confirm the diagnosis? The confirmation of the diagnosis is by your cardiac MRI, right? And the drug that you need to give is beta blocker. And treatment of choice will be ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator, okay? So this is about all the conditions which will be causing your palpitations, okay? That is sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, premature atrial contractions, mat, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, premature ventricular contractions, conditions causing VT and as well as VF. So, and what are the, the last important cardiac emergency? So we have discussed syncopal attack. We have discussed conditions causing chest pain conditions causing palpitations. And what are the conditions which will cause dyspnea as a cardiac emergency presenting to the emergency department? It is mainly your heart failure, right? And what will be the drug of choice for the heart failure causing dyspnea? Why is this particular dyspnea? Mainly due to acute pulmonary edema. So you need to give the loop diuretic. And what is that loop diuretic we give is the furosemide. Right, And we, what is the first line treatment? You need to connect the patient immediately to the oxygen mask. And the other drugs that can be given for acute pulmonary edema is we can give morphine 
that will reduce the preload and you can also give nitrates but when you are giving nitrates you should be very careful the systolic blood pressure should be more than 90 millimeters of mercury so that is another important cardiac emergency okay so this finishes your cardiac emergencies so if at all if the patient presenting to the casualty for any cardiac problem these are the four symptomatology syncopal attack chest pain palpitations and chest, uh, dyspnea and I have discussed all the conditions which will cause syncopal attack, chest pain, palpitations, and dyspnea. And what will be their first line treatment, confirmatory diagnosis, and treatment of choice. Okay. And with this, I will wind up this session. You can follow me on my Instagram handle, that is Rajesh Guba, for updates related to the general medicine. Wherein, by following this particular Instagram handle, you will get some quick pointers, your daily questions, which will be useful for your upcoming FMG exam and as well as the NEET PG exam. And this particular PDF will be uploaded on my Instagram handle. I will send you the link, which will connect you to my Telegram channel. Okay. So, Right, I'll upload this PDF on my Instagram handle. Please follow my Instagram handle wherein you will get these PDFs. And so today will be the cardiac emergency. And on Saturday, upcoming Saturday, I'll come up with another important uh, neurology emergencies or respiratory emergencies. We will discuss that on Saturday. Okay. So with this, let me wind up this session. If you have any doubts, right, any doubts, you can text me on my Instagram. I'm not very much active on Telegram. You can text me on my Instagram handle where I will clear all your doubts related to general medicine. Thank you very much. See you again on Saturday. Coming up with either neurology emergencies or respiratory emergencies, I will discuss. Thank you very much.